Buck, it's very nice to welcome you to the program. Uh, before we start talking about the platters, in fact, let's go back a little bit further, because uh, in the early days you were involved in the emergence of Ella Fitzgerald. Well, I was a jazz arranger first. Before that, I was a jazz musician, playing with the Chicago-style jazz with Benny Goodman and all the rest of that era. Of course, that was all two-beat jazz, mm. Dixieland, which later evolved to swing when Benny hit. And uh, I was an arranger in uh, New York for Chick Webb, and Ella Fitzgerald had won an amateur contest at the Apollo Theater. Mm. And so I tipped him off about her, and that was the start. Was it easy to record her? Uh, oh, she is the most sensational person I've ever worked with because her voice is like an instrument. Mm. She can sit there for hours and just ad-lib, and you won't believe the things that come out. Because you've worked with some remarkable people, haven't you, during that time and since. Who are some of the people in the jazz area that you've worked with? Well, I worked for Duke Ellington, Comp Basie, the uh, Darcy Brothers, and, uh, well, it's all... Yeah. <laughs> trying, to, <laughs> trying to record all of them, but I was very thoroughly involved in jazz before I got into uh, rock and roll and the platters and all of that. How did that change come about, in fact? Uh, I guess I overworked. I had a nervous breakdown back around 1953 or 54, and I sort of retired, but... Uh, uh, musicians can't retire, composers. And so I had about two years of raising flowers and grapefruit, and then I decided to go back in the business again, and by that time it had all changed. Mm. The, the scene then was country music, and then it turned into uh, what they called at that time race music, mm. which I was thoroughly acquainted with because I grew up with it. Mm. And uh, I found Tony Williams washing cars, was impressed with his voice, and we organized the platters, and uh, it took us two years to break yes, the was, record. Yeah, I was going to say. W was that two years of work outside the recording studio, or were there records? Oh, no, that was work of getting the group together, because they were five amateurs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to teach them stage presence and singing and develop Tony's voice. Uh, it was a wonderful voice, but completely undisciplined. Mm -hmm. And I come from a school where, uh, like jazz, it's free, but it's still discipline. Mm. And arrangements are all discipline. Because mm. I was talking about the 14 gold records, in fact, that they've sold. I think I'm right in saying 12 of them you've composed yourself. Right. Do you think of yourself more in terms of a, uh, as being a composer? Uh, I uh, am going back to that now uh, because uh, you can't, as I said before, you can't take music out of you. And uh, a lot of my time has been devoted to the business end of it, which mm. I am now completely divorcing myself with and staying with the music end of it, which is me. Mm. Because I was a lawyer and I quit being a lawyer to be a musician. I'm going to stay that way now. <laughs> <laughs> this is your first visit to Britain for quite some time, isn't it? Uh, the last time we were here was uh, in 1958, I think it was, uh, when only you and the Great Pretender were big. We played the Palladium mm. at that time. Mm. There's been a tremendous change. I didn't even recognize London. Really? Because really. yeah. the group itself has changed considerably too, hasn't oh, it? Oh, yes. Uh, the group, that's one of the reasons why I came over, because there's been imitators. Uh, you know, it's a chauvinistic remark. I don't intend it that way, but like they say that uh, you all look alike, see? And you've had promoters here and in the United States that would take four fellas and a girl, put them together, and call them the mm. platters. Mm. And, of course, uh, it resolves to uh, people coming up and asking the platters, uh, how do you manage to keep so young, mm. see? Because actually, they come to hear the songs, <laughs> mm. and uh, they could care, well, they care about who's singing, but they close their eyes and reminisce. Mm. And the scene has happened with the Harlem Globetrotters the same. They've had changes, but the people come to be entertained, and that's what we try and do. Just one final question. What about future plans now with the Platters, or with, are, are you recording any other bands at the moment? Uh, we're, re we're recording, uh, we start with a new label uh, next week, and uh, we have two singles of Only You and Twilight Time, which is doing very well, I hear. Mm. Uh, we're going to Holland to record for Phonogram, uh, to uh, televise for Phonogram. And then we've just been invited to go to Israel for the uh, 25th anniversary of the founding of Israel. And we, uh, all of us, are, of course, thrilled about that because, uh, well, I've always wanted to go back. We played there in 1958, and... Mm. Uh, we were just treated like royalty. Mm. 
And the best of luck to you to the Platters for their gig in Birmingham tonight. Well, I'd like to say hello to them and say, <laughs> you better mind your uppers. I hit television before you did. <laughs> <laughs> Buck Ram, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.